Good morning again. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Title, as you can see, is Apologetics. When I started doing this, I said, well, I'm talking to myself. So don't ever feel put out when I'm starting to talk because I'm talking to me too. Ray taught me, thank you, Ray, that if you get your material from one source, it's called plagiarism. But if you get it from multiple sources, it's called research. <laughs> so let me share some things uh, that I found when I researched. <laughs> and what is apologetics? And what does it have to do with Christianity? When you hear the word apologetics, it might make you think of the word apology. And when you're asked to apologize, you're admitting you did something wrong. And the married men out here said, well, you apologize even when you didn't do something wrong. <laughs> when I was introduced to apologetics, I was a baby Christian. And much like a reformed smoker, I was vocal about my newfound Christianity. And I was not about to apologize for it. Apologetics, when used in a biblical context, takes an entirely different meaning. I was told it meant to defend your faith. I didn't like that either. I didn't think Jesus needed to be defended. Well, thankfully, I had a bunch of smart people, and they were very patient with me. And they explained exactly what apologetics means. You can see on the screen, that's. It, Apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia. And then it had in here, and it's pronounced apologia. But it means a verbal defense. And it's crucial for us as believers to be equipped with a solid defense of our faith. And the tools to articulate and defend the truth of Christianity with clarity and conviction. Apologetics is a task which the scriptures lay upon all believers. It's not a call exclusively for the pastors or the elders or other church leaders. It's for all you all. I've been in the South 48 years. <laughs> but in the next slide you'll see, apologetics is not about apologizing for our faith, but rather about proving, providing rather, a reasoned defense for it. Scripture exhorts us to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us. In 1 Peter 3.15 we read, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. Give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Or another way to say it, you do it in truth and love. Now Jesus chose only one highly educated man, and that was Paul, to be his uh, apostles. The rest were fishermen, tax collector, a doctor, etc. you know, just regular, normal people of the day who were available and willing to be used by the Lord, just like you and me. They were filled with the Spirit of God, just like you and me. They were used as vessels of God, just like he wants to use you and me. God uses all things for his glory, so we do apologetics by faith. The Lord has called every Christian to be ready to make a defense of their faith. That means you are called to give reasonable answers to questions about Christianity. We'll look at 1 Peter 3.15 again. And where he says, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer. Always be prepared to give an answer. To everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. Now not to be, apologetics is not to be confused with contending for the faith. Jude, brother of James and half-brother Jesus wrote this in uh, 
Jude 1.3. He said, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write for you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. As Jude writes, contending for the faith doesn't just pertain to lofty theological matters or apologetics. It also pertains to the practical purity of God's people. How we live our everyday lives is part of this contending for the faith. If we are grumblers or fault finders, we're not contenders for the faith. In fact, we're da damaging the faith. If we turn God's grace into permission to willfully make our own path contrary to the Lord's word, we are not contenders for the faith. We are damages of Christ's testimony. If we speak arrogantly or nasty, we are again out of alignment with the spirit of the gospel and smear the name of God and of his people. You see, defending the faith is when you explain to others why you believe. But contending for the faith is when you show others how you live. Now, this does not mean that you must have a PhD well, that you must go to seminary, but it does mean that you'll need to read and study the Bible. Amen. Pastor Ray, he does many, spends many hours a week preparing for the Wednesday night study, and if you're physically able, you may want to take advantage by attending. Also, we have an adult Sunday school at 9.30 every Sunday morning. It would give you more opportunity to study the Bible. The other thing I, uh, I tried to do was to memorize scripture. Maybe there's a scripture that will hit home with you, will remind you of who you are in Christ. You might want to try doing that. Um, I learned to memorize two scriptures. One was better to live on a corner of a roof than to live with a quarrelsome wife, Proverbs 21, nine. And then another one, Better to live in a desert with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. <laughs> Proverbs 21, 19. Now my wife had mixed emotions. She was so happy I was reading the Bible and studying scripture. But she gave me that look, that look right now. <laughs> and she was not too pleased that the first two scriptures that I memorized were Proverbs 21, 9 and 21, 19. But anybody that knows my wife, Lou, knows she's not a quarrelsome woman. She's not a nagging woman. She's a God-fearing, loving, supportive wife. Am I out of trouble yet? <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. The next scripture I memorized, and this one was um, 25, 30 years ago. But it always stuck with me. It was John 14, 26, when Jesus was trying to get his uh, address his apostles because he was soon to be leaving them. So he wanted to tell them, give them some comfort, and he said, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Yes. Well, we all have that Holy Spirit in us to remind us of everything that Jesus did. And he directs our life if we lean on and trust in the Holy Spirit. So apologetic serves two dual purpose, a dual purpose of strengthening the faith of believers. And this is important. It's offering a credible witness to skeptics and seekers. Christianity is not a blind leap into the unknown, but rather a rational, coherent worldview grounded in truth. Apologetics help us uncover the rationality of our faith by examining evidence from various disciplines such as history, science, and philosophy. And oh yeah, the Bible. The historical reliability of the Bible, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and fulfilled prophecies of powerful evidence that validate the truth claims of Christianity. What is the first thing 
that unbelievers might say to you about their own belief or your belief. What I've heard is they'll say, well, the Bible is just a bunch of old fairy tales. And that was written by a bunch of old gray-haired white men. And I laugh because I doubt there were any white men in the Middle East back at the time when the Bible was being written. But I said, you could answer as a Christian, you could answer with 2 Peter 121. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Yes. Or 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training right in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now that would be helpful if you were talking to a Christian, but it wouldn't help you if you were talking to someone that didn't have a belief. Uh, Paul told us about this and when he wrote in 1 Corinthians 2.14, He said, the natural man, what is the natural man? Unbelievers, does not ha accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. And we keep that in mind when we're trying to share the good news of the gospel. I'm sure that as you matured in your Christian life, scripture that you might have read at one time that didn't make a lot of sense, but as you grew, God revealed a little bit more and a little bit more. He only gives you what you can handle. So you might have read through the Bible five times, and five times you're gonna get a little bit more and a little bit more. That's my experience, and I'm sure it's with others as well. All right, but a better way, I think, is to try to appeal to their practical sense. Remember Jesus used parables when he was talking to people. And, and, and the Bible was written, I would tell them this, just use scientific facts. The Bible was written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different authors in three different languages on three different continents. The biblical authors lived in different eras and came from different cultures. Some were, you see, Jews, Gentiles, kings, some were paupers, some were highly educated, some had little formal education, some were religious leaders, some were political leaders, some were prophets, and some were simply ordinary, everyday folks. So the variation in the author's backgrounds, it's enormous to say at least, it's a cross-section of what the, the world looked like at that time. So with this much diversity, one might expect the Bible to contain different assertions of the truth. Did you ever play that game with a group of people and it's, what do they call it, telephone? You, you tell them one at this end and they have to repeat it to the other end and when it gets to the other end it doesn't sound like anything that you started with. Not so with the Bible. The Bible has what they call textual criticism and they've tried over and over and over to find something wrong with the Bible, and they have not been successful. But you gotta remember, the Bible has one continuing, under, a unifying message from the first book to the last, and the likelihood that 40 plus people who wrote in three different languages, lived on three different continents and different eras, would come up with one continual message, one continual theme, and one continual plan of salvation is nothing short of miraculous. There's no other religious book that shares the uniqueness of the Bible. And the scarlet thread of Jesus runs through the entire 66 books. I was gonna talk about that, but I decided to do apologetics instead. But one day, if I am blessed with the opportunity, I will go through and show you where Jesus is in all 66 books, and I'll do it in 20 minutes. 4.30. <laughs> well, you'll stay for the next service. 
that, uh, you know, when you think about it, the history of Jesus is well established by early Roman, Greek, and Jewish sources. And this is another thing that you could use to explain why the Bible is such a trustworthy document. These extra biblical writings affirm the major details of the New Testament portrait of the Lord. First century Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, you might have heard of him, but he made specific references to John the Baptist, Jesus Christ, and James in his Antiquities of the Jews. And in this work, Josephus gives us many background details about the Herods, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the high priests like Annas and Caiaphas, and the Roman emperors mentioned in the Gospels and Acts. So it's a collaboration that or, or authenticates more of the Bible. And you might also, and this one to me is a really good one, is bring up the Dead Sea Scrolls. They were found, first found in 1947. They are the oldest biblical manuscripts that we possess and dating from 250 BC to 135 AD. And the 800 to 900 fragments, they said, were discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls contain portions of every book in the Old Testament, except Esther. <clears throat> because I knew they didn't have Esther in that one. That's why I preached about Esther last year. <laughs> That's a lie. <laughs> but it does contain a whole book of Isaiah. And these fragments, they weren't all written in Hebrew. So uh, among the other languages, let's see, they were written in Aramaic, Greek, and ancient Hebrew alphabet known as Paleo-Hebrew. So the other thing the unbelievers say is God does not exist. One could look outside and say God exists. But let's deal with the science behind it because science doesn't exclude the belief of God. It reinforces the belief of God. In 1966, Carl Sagan hosted a famous TV documentary. It was called Cosmos. <coughs> Excuse me. He thought in order to have life, <coughs> you just needed two conditions, a right kind of star and a planet at the right distance. Well, that proved wrong. And more than 50 years later, scientists have come to the realization that more than 200 conditions, or like I like to think of it as constants, have to be just right for life to exist and thrive. I, I, conditions could change. Constants don't change. Just based on their word, constants are always the same. And for example, food and water are basics. We all need that. So what makes the earth inhabitable? You got an atmosphere that protects from radiation while maintaining warmth. And, and an earth that must um, maintain the right angle on its axis. If it just wobbles off, we're either gonna fry or freeze. And the right distance from the sun and the right speed of rotation. That didn't happen with a big bang. That happened by the creation of our Lord Jesus. I mean, God. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah 45, 18, the Lord is God. He made the skies and the earth. He put the earth in its place. He did not want the earth to be empty when he made it. He created it to be lived on. He said, I am the Lord. There is no other God. So as I dug deeper into the meaning and application of apologetics, I realized more fully that apologetics is a way to convince unbelievers that God exists. And you, you can't use scripture alone. It must be con combined with scientific data because that's how we can relate. Now, apologetics en uh, engages with philosophical inquiries concerning the existence of God, the problem of evil, and the nature of truth, morality, and meaning. Apologetics also addresses contemporary culture challenges, including relativism, Relativism. Well, we know we're experiencing that today. And just a, a short example is, and it's said in scripture, 
Someday they will call good evil and evil good. And we're seeing that in our world today. And then secularism, you know what that is, and atheism. So apologetics equips uh, us believers to navigate doubts and uncertainties, fostering a deep understanding and appreciation for our faith. We want to share the good news of the gospel. Is there anything that we get if we tell someone else about the good news and they're saved other than feeling good? No. It's for them, and we don't want to see anybody perish. Hell is not full of people that God rejected. Hell is full of people that rejected God. So we want everybody to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So the power of apologetics lies not only in intellectual persuasion, but also in the transformative impact it has on lives. Countless testimonies attest to how apologetics has led individuals from skepticism to faith, from confusion to clarity, and from despair to hope. <coughs> Allergies. So let's examine what a Christian is. You're a Christian, and if, stop me any way along here if I get anything wrong. A Christian is someone who has recognized their sinfulness and inability to save themselves and has placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And this is important when we look at Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it's by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. We could never work our way into heaven. We can't buy our way into heaven. So God made it free. It's a simple process. Let's go to the second part. Christians believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for their sins and that his resurrection from the dead provides the hope of eternal life. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then we go on to Christians believe in the Bible as God's word. Well, we just proved that. And seek to obey its teachers, really that God's commands are not burdensome, but are given for our good. 1 John 5 to 3 says, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. Furthermore, Christians are called to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love their neighbors as themselves. Mark 12, 29, 30, the most important one, Jesus said, is this, hear, O Israel, which for those who have studied the Bible a lot, that we also refer to as the Shema in the Old Testament. But Jesus answered some, uh, added a little bit to it. But he says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, the Lord is one. Love, your Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then we go on. This love is expressed by living a life that reflects Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit and by sharing the good news of the gospel with others. In Matthew 28, 19 through 20, it said, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He was talking to his apostles, but he was talking to us. We are also charged with the responsibility to go therefore and make disciples, and make disciples of all people that we can meet. Now, uh, I guess it was Ray last week, no, yeah, Ray last week, spoke about the fact that don't be a, a, a car salesman. If you share the gospel with somebody, don't expect to get the, the sale. You might just plant the seed and then someone else comes by and waters and it, it's all the work of the Holy Spirit anyway. I've heard too many people say, do you believe in Jesus? No, well, you're going to hell. I saw that one memo for sure. 
So today, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's too many people out there that claim to be Christian and they are pastors who are leading people astray. I heard a false teacher say, Mormons are Christians. Well, they're not. They may be good people, but they're not Christians. And then also they'll say, well, Jesus was not God. He was just a good man and a prophet. And then some pastors condone sexual immorality by performing same-sex marriages. And then they go along with the insane notion that a person may change their gender. Well, anyway, if you turn to Genesis 127, it says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. End of discussion. So Christians need to defend the faith and don't just sit there and bat lies into Christianity. I think as Christians, we sat too long and we're the majority, but we're silent. We need to speak up in love and truth. Many wolves are claiming to be Christian and are leading others astray. We've always known that we have a spiritual warfare. You have Satan and you have God. When you belong to God, Satan can't hurt you. But we know that Satan can influence so many people. So if you learn your scripture, you can spread Jesus, know about God, refute error, and expose evil. Call it what it is. And to make a defense refers to providing a reason to respond to questions about the faith and an explanation of our hopes in Christ. It is this hope that fuels our desire to share the good news of Jesus with those who have yet to embrace God or his message. It is this same hope that should fuel our resolve to stand firm in the midst of challenges. When you're dealing with uh, false teachers, Paul wrote to Timothy in uh, 2 Timothy 4.3. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. So, where do you find the truth? This is it. It's in the Bible. God didn't say it, and it's not true. So uh, let's go back to 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, and see if this re resonates with you as it did with me about our current state of affairs. And Ray was teaching us on uh, end times, rapture, and everything else for the last seven weeks now. And it says, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy. Without love, unforgiving, <coughs> slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good. Treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God and having a form of godliness but denying its power have nothing to do with such people. In today's highly politicized climate, I remind people, now I'm not endorsing candidates, so this is disclaimer, but in today's climate, everything is politicized. You, you, can, you can get in nanoseconds something that happened are completely around the world because of our social media. And some of it's not true. I know you take that and be surprised. But if you have, uh, if you always, and my family did, always voted because the person, candidate had a D or an R or an I after their name, things have changed quite a bit. And if you're a Christian, you need to vote the Bible. No candidate is perfect, and some are less perfect than others. But if you know a candidate supports abortion, gender change, and same-sex marriage, and you're really thinking about voting for them, you might want to have some quiet time with the Lord 
and ask them to speak to your heart and get some direction before you go to the polling place. We can't go along to get along. So let us pray.